Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall. And there's more to just drinking beer than beer itself. It's visual and ceremonial and communal. Jenny Fafflin of Dovetail Brewery is here to talk about building recipes, respect for lagers and drought beer, thoughts on what the Simpsons would drink, and proper beer service. But first up, we're able to bring you this show every week thanks to these sponsors. This dry January, party on all month long with Athletic Brewing Company's great tasting non-alcoholic craft beer. Their full lineup of craft styles lets you drink up and stay dry while keeping things fresh. And with brews starting at only 50 calories, you can stick to your resolutions all while saying cheers. Join the party at athleticbrewing.com and get free shipping on two six packs or more. Plus, new customers can get 10% off with code BEEREDGE10. And we're also brought to you by NZ Hops, a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. With a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations, the current day master growers proudly provide 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz, or you can find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. Jenny Fafflin is the marketing and creative manager at Dovetail Brewery in Chicago. She's also one of the four brewers on staff. That means she gets to spend her days talking about, thinking about, making, and drinking some of the most traditional and flavorful beers made in the U.S. today. Dovetail is no stranger to this show. Episode 5 featured Hagen Dost and Bill Westlink, the co-founders of the brewery, and that episode gave birth to This Week in Rauk Beer. If you follow Dovetail on social media, and you should, it's Jenny and her passion for bringing forth a realistic drinking experience in a digital format. Before Dovetail, she was an exam manager at the Cicerone Certification Program and is even an advanced Cicerone herself. Working at Dovetail, she can really explore her love of tradition, the beer industry, beer service, and those are all things that we talk about during the course of this episode. But we start off by going all the way back to the beginning. Here's our conversation. Was beer a part of your upbringing? It was. It was. Um, it's funny. Like uh, for me, like the, I remember tasting beer when I was probably like three or four years old, um, and it would be my father opening up his old style, and then having me, you know, suck off the foam. <laughs> um, <laughs> which probably kept me from drinking, you know, beer until I was an adult <laughs> in a way. Um, but I, I, and again, like my, my, my grandmother too would always have an old style, uh, you know, they're going through some old photos. There'd be those old seventies flat top cans of old style, um, in the photos next to her. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, beer is like, familial it's it's something that I you know <laughs> for, for good or bad reasons I don't know um but I think of my dad right and old style too is like this you know pale lager that's kind of synonymous with Chicago yeah um and uh I remember you know watching Cubs games with my dad and he'd be drinking his old style and uh it, it, it it's also a, a beer of place um in a, in a way as well so it reminds me of my my father and that it also reminds me of of growing up um here in in the midwest and specifically in chicago did, were you did you ever have conversations with your dad or your grandmother about why old style was it just because that's what you drank in chicago or i'm pretty sure it was just because i mean it was it was the it was the most accessible you know you know, regional, uh, lager made at the time. Um, like, and, and, and it was, it was, I mean, that's the only beer I knew. Um, and you know, I, I don't think I even had a Belgian beer until I was 21 years old and I walked into the hop leaf and my mind was freaking blown. <laughs> <laughs> all, of the, all of those tap handles for old style. Wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, I, I walked in and uh, they were pouring quack into one of those apparatuses. 
Oh and of yeah, course, one of the hourglass. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're you're a 21 year old kid, and you're like, I want that. Like, I want whatever is happening right there. I want that because you know. And then you wake um, up four days later, wondering yeah. what the hell just happened. <laughs> yeah. What the heck just happened? Um. So so yeah, I I, I just think beer was um. I don't know. It, it was it was something that they didn't have to think about, and I don't think that's a negative thing. Like beer should be easy, um, and I think that's what it was for my family. It was just something that you um, enjoyed, um, you know, with dinner um, or, or watching the Cubs, <laughs> um, or or, mow, or you know mowing the lawn, like you know that the whole thing around lawnmower beer. That's a thing. <laughs> yeah. You obviously had, though, a broader beer education and have been exposed to uh, styles from around the world and been able to you know, meet brewers and travel. And um, do you think, though, that familial relationship helped inform or help shape the brewer that you are now? Is that stronger than mm-hmm. all the other education that came your way? I think so. I mean, there isn't a, you know, uh, thinking about my, my dad when I, you know, when I get to, to make this beer for sure. Um, because I, it's a, you know, a beer that he enjoys and that's like the ultimate, like, you know, pride that I can take in, in, in making, in making this beer. Um, like the, the biggest compliment that I think we ever get is when somebody comes into the tap room and says, this beer reminds me of home. Um, and there's just something so special about that. And, 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 and I think it's not only that, you know, designing a beer, you know, designing a beer for all the senses, right. You, you know, of course there's, there's aroma, there's, there's taste, Um, uh, there's the way it looks, um, and then there's the way, uh, it, uh, it looks in a, it looks in a glass, you know, when it's being served, but also I think there's designing a beard to, uh, what does it mean culturally? Um, and, and how, and I think that goes back to my original comment that I don't think was on the air, but like about drinkability, like what you know, ultimately, uh, bring the beer to be something that's also cultural. And I think drinkability has a lot to do with it. It's a word that gets thrown around quite a bit these days, uh, right. drinkability, and it's used as a marketing, you know, a marketing term quite a bit, but there is, you know, an actual human element behind it or a human desire behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like, I think, and and I haven't quite figured out how to how to you know say this without dismissing the complexity of of other of certain beers. Like dovetail beer is also complex, but it's easy to get to know and it's easy to drink. And I think beer should always be easy. I don't think. And if you want to, if you want to sit down uh, with a beer um, that's that's like a lambic style, that's insanely complex, I think that's great too, and that's something that I also enjoy doing. But for my majority of my beer drinking, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> and I and I just ugh, I I say that, and I I hope that doesn't rub anybody the wrong way um yeah so that's that that for me is 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 drinkability (laughs) when you're putting a recipe together Mm -hmm. how does drinkability factor into when you first put pen to paper um i mean honestly it has to be a beer that i will want to drink over and over again um, and I start by imagining 
myself at the bar and what that beer looks like in a glass. And then I kind of work backwards from there. You start because, with the visual cues first. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I think well, because we, as humans, we, we eat and drink with our eyes. Right. Yeah. So I think that's, um, one of the more important parts of, of recipe design is, is thinking about how that beer is going to look when it's, when it's served. And I think that has a lot of part to do with drinkability. Um, like looking at a, at a beer in a, in a, in a clean glass, in a proper glass with a really big cap of foam, it invites you into that beer and, but it invites you in a way that, again, it's easy. You're going to pick up that beer and you're going to, you're going to start drinking it. And then you go into aroma and then you go into, um, you know, flavor. One of the the highest compliments that I think I can pay the the dovetail beers that I've had in the past is I usually don't start fully appreciating it until I'm done with the second glass and going on to the third. Because that drinkability is there, but you you were also saying before, like it has to have layers and it has to have some nuance to it. Um, Mm -hmm. And but that isn't apparent necessarily with the first sip, at least not for me. Um, it, is that what, do you want it to be apparent at the first sip or is it better if it unfolds over the course of a couple of rounds? I mean, it's always better over the course of a couple of rounds. <laughs> I love people to be drinking more than one dovetail beer. Well, sure. I mean, it's good for uh, but business, yeah. but like, but. <laughs> No, no, I think, and that's the thing is like, yes, like as long as you have enjoyment with that first round, I, I you know, I, I think what, what's, what's really interesting is like, I think Harold McGee has said like, you know, flavor is the thing that gives us the most pleasure in food, but it's an, also an aspect that we know the least about. So I don't necessarily need to understand why I'm enjoying this beer. But if I get through the second or third round and I start to maybe recognize why, I mean, that's great. But ultimately, I just want people to um, just just to enjoy, just to enjoy the beer um, and hopefully come back for for a second round. You were saying before that you want to make beers that you know that you're going to want to drink. Are there beers that you make? that you don't just be by nature of being a brewer or are you guys the kind of place where you just kind of get to make the beers that excite y'all? I think that, yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. We get to make the beers that excite us. We get to make beers that we, that we want to drink. What is a beer that's coming up? that you're excited to be drinking? Like what's in the, what's in the tanks right now? Well, in the tanks right now, um, we've been focusing a lot of on our core beers, um, which is, you know, a great problem to have uh, that we keep producing beers that people want to drink. So like in the tanks right now, we have um, our Hellas, we have a Vienna lager, um, we'll have a Hefeweizen, um, and then our Kolsch. Um, so those are like our core beers. We also have yeah. a lager, um, which is our, our house, uh, house, you know, pale lager. Um, it's kind of a Franconian style beer, uh, pale lager. Um, we also have a rock Doppelbach <laughs> in the tanks uh, coming out uh, within the next few weeks. I mean, um, you're so pandering to the right audience, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then when is this coming out? Tomorrow. This is going to be, uh, okay. So I'm not going to yeah. say anything yet. No, oh, come I, on. <laughs> um, this is going to, this is going to go up. This is going to go up about six hours after we record it. Oh, wow. Okay. Ooh. Come on. Uh, come on. Spill the tea. Mm-mm. I'm going to keep my mouth shut for now, but oh. I'm just going to say, um, we're pretty stoked, uh, to, to make this beer and, 
it might be, if you know our brewery well, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to see us make this beer, but I think it's going to be a surprise to quite a few people. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I don't, I don't have my dovetail decoder <laughs> ring. Um, I can tell you it's not German. Okay. Well, that's, that narrows it down. Yeah. That's fun. Um, continental all right, Europe. So it's, con- we, we only do continental European beer. So, so it's not German. So that should narrow it down. But. Okay. So it's a smoked mm-hmm. lambic. How did you know? <laughs> Actually, somebody told me like um, <laughs> they recently had a peated creek, um, and they said it was really, really good. So I could get it, down on that. Yeah, little cherry, Sorry. little iodine, little yeah, yep, mm-hmm. little Robitussin, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was very that piqued my interest. So you know what? Never say never. You might get a boat <laughs> creek out of Dovetail one of these days. I'd be excited. You guys make a nice creek to begin with. Um, the because you're making continental European beers, um, okay. and that's your focus. I mean, there's a lot of room to play in. Mm-hmm. There can be creativity. Um, you guys obviously have the cool ship, which you know adds a little bit of dovetail, uh, genesis qua to everything that you guys put out, but. We're two years into a pandemic now, just about two years into to, to a pandemic. Has two years of brewing under COVID changed you as a brewer at all or the way that you approach making beer? Mm. That's a great question. I don't think it's changed me, but it definitely... You know, it it was really sad to be brewing um, up until June of last year. We shut down our tap room. Yeah. So it was it was really sad to be in an empty brewery <laughs> uh, for for hours and hours at a time. And you know. Uh, we work one per one brewer per shift. So there is, there is often times when, you know, I'd be finishing up the shift and I'd be walking out of uh, the brewery into the tap room um, and it'd be empty. And uh, what it, when it could have been filled with people and that really kind of, you know, affected me, <clears throat> you know, emotionally, uh, especially uh, a year and a half ago dreading um of finishing up my shift and not hearing that the warmth of of you know the music that the bartenders play and just you know the the low conversations and um it was there was definitely something missing and not being able to really see people enjoy what you, you know, what you've been doing day in and day out. Um, so that kind of, that was, that was difficult. Um, and I just hope, you know, that people were able to uh, still find a connection with, with our brewery um, during that time. And yeah, because like, <laughs> that was, that's a big part of why I enjoy being a beer brewer is like, watching people um, enjoy the beer I make. So that was, that was missing for like two years. <laughs> Do the beers that you make, I mean, I, I think all beers taste better when you're in a group, um, mm. when you're out at a place, uh, mm-hmm. when you're in your backyard where, you know, you can have a shared tasting experience, but you're with people. Um, Do you feel that way about your beers? And the brewery spirits that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, dovetail beers are social are meant to be social beers. Um, you know, it's, it's beer made for, for hanging out, you know, hanging out with somebody, you know, that hopefully, you know, also enjoying their time um, drinking beer, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think at the heart of Dovetail beer is, is, is that it's a social beer. And I think that's, that goes back to drinkability too. Right. Um, like what this definition of drinkability isn't just like, you know, it's, it's a balance. We're not talking just about taste. I'm talking about like emotional and cultural drinkability as well. <laughs> as yeah. corny as that, as corny as that sounds. But, uh, but I think, yeah, at the heart of Dovetail is, um, is it, it is, it's a social beer. Um, and, and I think that has a lot to do with, you know, Hagen and Bill and, and them, um, you know, going to school in Munich and then visiting these very communal uh, beer drinking spaces. Um, also, you know, like we do a Kolsch night at our brewery and it's, it's always one of the best nights. Um, How? Be, uh, because it just, it, it, it brings you together over beer um, in a different way. Um, that, and, and I think there's excitement in that as well. Um, of course, you know, up to a, to a corner, it's like, whatever, this is like every single day, but, um, but for us, you know, just seeing, you know, a tray of crumps come out and, you know, there's eight, 18, <laughs> Uh, you know, songs on those and you, you, you roll in with a crew. So you're rolling in with, with, you know, a group of people to have part of that, that experience. Um, and it's, it's a very, it's a very communal experience in that way. And also you have, you know, the beer garden furniture set up. Um, so you have these long tables where you do, you know, end up sharing a table with somebody that you might not know. Um, but the, the that, just, that, that just sounds so weird during a pandemic though. Yeah, it does. And that sucks. <laughs> and it, it really does. Like and summer of 2019, I'm all for it. Yeah. January of 22, I'm like, ah, I want to know who's next to me. Yeah, that sucks. It sucks. Um, and hopefully we can turn a corner to a point when <sighs> we're we working can, towards it. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that again. And that, but. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I just think there's there's like a, a socialness to it. There's a again like it's it's communal in a way. The, there's a bunch of I'm gonna say theater, but ceremony, romance, experience that it seems dovetail puts into the beers. It's not just hey, these are great looking beers nice head of foam, nice clean glassware, appropriate glassware. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of thought into the overall drinking experience. And 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 I think Kolsch night is a is is a perfect example of that. But um you're in a marketing role at the brewery as well. Uh and getting people interested in coming in um for these events, I, I, mm -hmm. I know fun, falls under your purview. Is it a challenge or are people genuinely excited about doing something different with their beer? I think so. I mean, I think um, most humans are interested or in, in, in opportunities that they don't, that are unfamiliar to them, you know? Um, and I think, you know, we're not <laughs> a lot of us aren't traveling over to Germany right now. Um, so if we can, you laughed, and, you laughed like your coworkers are walking out the door with, with suitcases under their arms right now. Yeah, no, no, no one. Okay. All right. We're all, we're all staying put. We've all stayed put. For the all best. right. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's beer service is an aspect that I think um, that now I think more breweries are starting to think about, which is great because uh, what goes behind the scene uh, of making the beer is uh, important, but what's happening behind the bar is equally important because that's your, you know, that's your last, uh, that's your first impression with, with a beer. 
And then that's your last point of contact with the beer as well. Um, depending on the point of view, whether you're the, the beer drinker or, or the, or the person serving the beer. And I think uh, what's really cool is there's like all these beer service traditions that uh, breweries are starting to explore. Like how, again, we drink and eat with our eyes. So um, the, the, you know, a, a trend, I guess we could call it is like, Breweries getting the the side uh, pool faucet. The uh, what's it? The 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 lucre pearl. Yeah. Yeah, the lucre, or they're doing lucre, um, yeah, lucre, yeah. lucre, or they're doing uh, you know, slow pours. Right. Again, like yeah. what's the you know, is it marketing? Fine. I don't. You know, it's like it's like the Guinness pour, like the perfect pour. Um, <laughs> but hey, hundred hundred and nineteen point five seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I except on St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. I think, I think it's one nineteen point five. Yeah. yeah. I've told this story before, but I was with Fergal Murray, who is then the, uh, the, the Guinness brewmaster, uh, and the ambassador that they would send out to places. I was with him, uh, two nights before St. Patrick's day or night before St. Patrick's day in New York city, a couple of years ago. And they were making a big thing about the show and everything. And we were out and we were having a couple of pints afterwards. And I was like, so really on St. Patrick's day, when the bars are crowded and it's pour as many <laughs> pints as quickly as possible, uh, do you really care about the 119.5 seconds? And he's like, absolutely not. Like we no, no, just serve them in plastic cups <laughs> and get them into as many thirsty people as possible. Like, or, or something to that effect. But he was like, yeah, it's on St. Patrick's day, the most sacred day of drinking, uh, all traditions are off, but yeah. Right. Right. But, but um, there is something to be said, though, about uh, about some of these traditions or, you know, the Instagram ability or the, you know, making. Absolutely. I think it has given like a new appreciation for foam, right? Like, all right, you might think, yeah. OK, all right. It's going to sound corny as heck. But yes, I think cause, because, you know, I serve at like beer festivals, you know, back in the day and like. You would you would be like oh yeah here's a you know here's a hefeweizen and people would see that big head and they'd ask <laughs> they'd be like uh can you like top it off a little bit it's like <laughs> no man that's the best part come on is this a conversation you have to have with your family as well <laughs> yeah yeah please please stop chintz in my glass with uh yeah yeah there no foam is good man and then like yeah it's like if people are posting photos on Instagram of their beautiful slow pours, that only helps all of us, I think, personally. I don't know. What's Even it? if it is all marketing, uh, you know. <laughs> well, no, I, but but it's but it also does affect the taste. Like you're it right. Does. Like yeah. More in a minute, but first, thanks to the companies that support Drink Beer, Think Beer. This dry January. Party on all month long with Athletic Brewing Company's great tasting non alcoholic craft beer. Order yours at athleticbrewing.com and get free shipping on two six packs or more. Plus, new customers get 10% off with code BEEREDGE10. And NZ Hops, a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years to produce some of the world's finest hops. NZ hops are like no others, unique in their flavors and aromas. Visit nzhops.co.nz to explore more. Now, back to the conversation. What is an aspect, you know, as maybe uh, we can start to get back out into the world and start to go to bars more regularly or breweries more regularly and et cetera, et cetera. What is a piece of bar service of beer service that you would like to see become more widely practiced or adopted? Mm. Mm. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think I do, I do really like uh, this whole check style service that's kind of uh, come into fashion. Um, I know those you know, those faucets are like super duper expensive, so it's not something that <laughs> every well you can get some knockoff do. ones, but yeah, 
sure. But also there's also um, a certain level of education that goes into it too. Like you got to make sure that your bar staff is educated and knows how to use these faucets um, because otherwise, you know, you're just wasting your money. But I think that's what's cool about them is showing different, different ways that beer can be served. Um, and I'm talking about like the milk pour versus, you know, the, the standard pour. And again, like all this is probably Pilsner or Cal like yeah. marketing. I don't know. Um, but the milk I mean, pour like, must really drive your family nuts. <laughs> but it's just like, yeah. Um, but I mean, like, like, beer so I'm totally casting dispersions on your family for comedic effect. And that's incredibly rude of me. And I'm sorry. <laughs> they, you know what? They, they, they would probably laugh along with it. All right, fine. Um, they have good senses <laughs> of humor. They have good senses of humor. Um, and I gotta say my dad, my dad, my dad's, uh, beer drinking palate has expanded over the past, uh, few years. So, uh, he's not just drinking old style anymore is he but he's still drinking old style now now and again no he lives out in utah so uh actually milwaukee and a is his favorite okay he's drinking he's drinking non-alcoholic old milwaukee uh when i opened up the the beer fridge or the the fridge the last time i was home okay <laughs> yeah is, is 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 he imbibing on some of the stuff you're making yes yeah i send him i send him uh beer like every other month or so <laughs> what does he what is he as an old as a classic old style drinker what's the beer that dovetail makes that he most mm. identifies with um i would say he i don't think he's had the lager because we never really packaged it but the the hellas okay so, yeah the hellas for sure and that's the beer we also like that hogan and bill um they designed that recipe to be like basically your every time kind of kind of fear reach for it every time i want to keep talking about bar service but like but i I just sort of opened up the the, this this train of thought of you know chicago is you know very much like still a macro lager town um Mm. it's got a great brewing tradition and a great small brewery scene but like all cities you know the real volume being done is going to be uh you know what is like miller light the popular one by you guys or is it uh i don't know what's there is it still hams so. yeah or old style still no i mean if we're talking macro loggers definitely a miller like okay we're a mill- we're a mill- i mean we're we're just you know down the street from milwaukee so yeah we're mostly drinking miller <laughs> down the street, and really hard. <laughs> but um. so so when people so there's there's got to be education to the macro drinkers who walk in hearing like, Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a lager brewery um, and, or Pilsner. And they understand those words. Yeah. Well, what's the conversation like with, you know, the non-craft sect that walks in? Well, I think we have a really great um, crew that works in our tap room and really, you know, if it's, it's really somebody who comes in and has no idea what they want to drink, um, you know, they'll certainly ask what they usually prefer to drink and hopefully steer them towards something on our menu, um, that they'll enjoy. Um, but if they're asking for something hoppy, we just send them to the brewery next door. Right. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Go down the street. Um, Who's down the uh, so, street? Is that Metropolitan down the street from you guys? Who's no, uh, Metropolitan is not too far away from us, but we have uh, a brewery named Beguile, which is like a block That's away. It. Yeah, um, and they do they have some really great pale ales um, and whatnot. And then Hot Butcher. Oh yeah, is, they're opening up, right? Yeah, they're moving into the old half acre space on Lincoln Avenue, which is like a seven minute walk from us. So I cannot wait to like when people come in, like. I, I want hoppy stuff. We'll be like, <laughs> kick, kick them down the road to hot butcher. Um, no, it's can great. There, I mean, can there, can there be, I, I, I keep at, I keep adding new questions onto all of this. Can there be a bar crawl that exists between, or uh, is there a Venn diagram that exists between the people who get excited about hot butcher haze and dovetail clean foam? Um, 
is, is there a diagram that exists where you'll see ping ponging between your two places? Do you think? I think so. I hope so. I mean, I work with some of those people here <laughs> um, who, who, you know, my, one of my, my office mates, she loves those, those really happy, hazy beers um, as well as the beers that we make here. So um, I do, I mean, I think if with anything too, like there's um, with ping ponging back and forth, um, we're in a constant, we're in an area um, that has been, you know, the, the chamber of commerce calls it malt row. Very cute. Um, where there's, there's quite a few breweries and I think there's, you know, something to be said about, you know, a rise in brewery tourism too. Right. Like mm-hmm. when you're, when you're, when you're visiting a new city now, it's like, well, I'm going to check out a couple, um, couple two tree breweries, especially yeah. when I'm in Chicago. So, um, yeah. Who's got so time I, for museums when right? there's so many breweries in town. Um, so I, I think like, especially on the weekends, when you do get visitors from out of town, I think you will see people and we do, I mean, we see it all the time with, with our neighbors at Beguile. We, we see people bounce, uh, back and forth, um, because <laughs> I think there's a lot of curiosity out there still. And, you know, whether it's dovetail, which is the unfamiliar one, or if it's, if it's top butcher, which is the unfamiliar one, but, you know, we're always happy to, to send traffic toward the other breweries in our area. There's something to be said though, for if somebody walks in and they're unfamiliar um, and let's go back to, you know, to that Miller drinker for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, Does the bar service and the, the show of it, um, the reverence for it, I guess is, is, is really the, the, the more apt term. Um, Does that help change drinkers perceptions do you, do you think that the act of simple beer service done well mm. can bring people to at least think about breweries like yours more often i hope so um it's funny like i i love it when a beer looks like the emoji so when you <laughs> <laughs> And I actually like tweeted about that. Yeah, you do. You do spend a lot of time on social media, so yeah, that's. Yeah. I uh, love it. I love it, and I think you know, it's, it, again, like if 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 that's what brings somebody into a beer, I, I hope so, and I hope that the beer that we're serving in our tap room rem- reminds people of oh, goofy, but like the quintessential beer, like the beer that we've been inundated with uh through commercials or or the beer that homer simpson you know drinks um you know he he has like the classic stein with with like the cap of foam on top yeah the handled mug and yeah yeah he's 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 a pale lager drinker you know he he was probably you know knocking back some old styles um would he uh, also drink the hellas do you think hell yeah I okay. think so. I think I think Homer Simpson would definitely be a hellas drinker. Marge would. I think she'd be a creek drinker. I think Marge would come here and drink creek. She seems like she would have an adventurous palate. I like that. <laughs> um, you were talking before about drinkability and the pendulum swinging. Uh, before we started, we were talking about the pendulum swinging, and then you brought up drinkability and, and all of that. Um, what's the ABV discussion like among the brewers these days? You mean the brewers at Dovetail or just brewers? Yeah, or you know, or just in general. But like, you know, yeah, the brewers at Dovetail. Like, how 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 often when you're putting something together, are you also thinking about ABV? Oh, um, certainly. I mean, we're. We have this saying that we're always A B C, always be balking. So we'll we'll uh, write a balk recipe about four times a year. Um, so that's like our higher A B B beers. But for the most part, I mean, our core beers. I think I w- they probably are. They're all around like twelve Plato. Um, the the Vienna Lager is thirteen Plato. So I mean, they're they're all in that range of not like 
super light, but they're not, nothing ever hits usually above 6%. Um, as far as our core beers go, our non bock beers. But then, yeah, we like to, we like to make the high octane beers every once in a while too. Um, but even then, like, it's not crazy. Um, uh, as far as, as far as the ABV is concerned, like, unless we throw it into a, a spirit barrel. So, okay. But I mean, I guess for, for, for drinkability though, there's been conversations of more flavor, less alcohol, um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, still being able to get, I mean, it's dry January, uh, mm-hmm. you know, people are thinking about non-alcoholics, um, you know, but, but low ABV beers and even things yeah. in like the, you know, the two or three range. Um, yeah, I, think I, I, get, a- I get jazzed by those. Totally. And I think it's really, I mean, one, there's the whole like English tradition of doing that, right? <laughs> of, of making, of making miles uh, that were what, three, four percent. But uh, as far as please like, stick looking, to continental Europe, uh, you're right. Can't talk about the island. <laughs> I just don't right. want you to get written up by HR. That's all. <laughs> um, okay. Well, we'll talk about Sweden then, uh, which is in continental Europe. Uh, so when I, so it, so Sweden also has like these leftover draconian um, liquor laws that are very that are you know uh, that was part of the same th- prohibition that that America went through right. Um, so for them to so so to get like above I forgot what three and a half percent ABV you have to go to a to a government owned. Uh, liquor store okay otherwise um your beer has to be below that to be sold in in grocery stores and of course like to get more um eyes on your beer you want to be in the grocery store you you get a wider distribution because uh i think the system bulligate also has like very um geographically oriented uh distribution as well so you you your brewery might be in southern sweden and you might not be able to get into the the government stores up in northern Sweden, of course, like don't know everything about this. I might be talking out of my my butt. But what was really interesting about going to Sweden was going into the grocery stores and seeing what these um, modern craft breweries were doing in this in this range of this range of three and a half percent and below. And you know, there was everything from American IPAs to Gozas to um, you know, you name it, porters, like, and I think it forced them into this kind of innovation to get really flavorful beers um, with a lower ABV. And they were all like pretty, pretty good beers too. Um, So I think some of that has come stateside. Like I think for so long, uh, Swedish craft brewing was, was influenced by American craft brewing, but I, I think now we're starting to see like it go the other way. Um, and, and that's kind of exciting. If you guys were to put on like a 2% lager, mm. would it sell? Mm-hmm. <sighs> that's a great question. Um, or I, I guess, I, 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 of course I mean, it would we, sell, but like, would it, would it sell done- in a way that would make you happy? We've done a Goldwyn Street, like our Goldwyn Street was three something. Yeah. Um, so we've done like really low alcohol beers before. Um, I think I think if it tastes good, <laughs> it would sell. Uh, that's a good. I, I feel like like a lot of our beers are already, um, again, like within that range of of lower alcohol. I'm not sure it would make sense for us to make. A two percent lager. Sure. I don't know, it'd be fun to try. Well, is that <laughs> is that what you wanted to tell us early no. on? Is that okay? Uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> Are you ready to tell us about that beer yet? Nope. <sighs> um, I w- wanted to just talk a little bit, just kind of go back to to your marketing hat of the way that the brewery is portrayed in social media Mm. and 
every time I see a dovetail uh, post, I want to like it. And I think it's because like one, I know you all um, and I've been there and I, I, I enjoy the place, but there's a real sense of place that comes through and something that makes the beer feel important, but accessible and something that makes me, even though I'm, you know, 1400 miles away, um, wishing that I could just walk down the street and, and, and be at your place. And you, you were sort of talking, you know, earlier about the beers that you want to make being accessible and, um, uh, you know, and, and even how old style was a beer of place. Um, is dovetail that are you, are you trying to make dovetail the place through your posts, through the marketing? I would, I would love that. Like I would, I would love for people to think that dovetail is of a place. Um, I think, again, I think you, you, you become more connected, um, to, to anything, uh, when it, when it's of a place, right? Like, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, thank you for saying those things because it definitely is an effort on my part to make sure that dovetail is, is approachable that dovetail is, is, you know, it's not too precious, <laughs> um, that it's something that, again, if you going back to that, you like that, that Miller light drinker, um, walking into our tap room, I want to make sure that that beer drinker is comfortable, um, in our space. And I think a lot of dovetail is not only the beer that we send out, but, but the tap room that we have here, on site at the brewery. So I do want it to be a sense of place. I do want people to see um, that it's so much more than, than, you know, just a, just a, a, a you know, a, an industrial factory. Like there's, there's, there's a heart to, to it. And that's at the heart of our operation is our tap room. And, um, and that's why it was like so heartbreaking you know, over the past two years to, to end my shift and walk through an empty tap room. Um, it just felt like part of the brewery was, was absolutely, was, was absolutely missing. Um, so I want people to make dovetail a place that they think of when they're, when they're, you know, whether if they're a local on the North side or if they're coming through and um, it's their first time in the city and they want to check out a couple of breweries, I absolutely want Dovetail to be that place. There's, it does strike me that there's like an earnestness about the post. Like you, you said, like not too precious. Um, and in some cases, you know, brewery social medias are, overly stylized or uh, trying to be edgy or trying to find out like what's trending right now and make a meme out of it that just sort of feels like the Steve Buscemi character from 30 Rock. Um, you know, there's there there's all these different paths that a brewery can take, but when something just sort of comes off as like genuine and what you see in a Instagram panel is essentially what you get when you walk through the doors there. I mean, it's, it's not really something that you can fake or stylize. I imagine it's just going to be, yeah, this is us. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. And it, we couldn't, we can't be, you know, edgy or, or trendy or I, it, it, people would immediately be like, what the heck is that tail up to? Now we do like memes. We do like memes. We love a good Ralph beer meme here at dovetail but you, um, again with the pandering everybody's already on board with you everybody in this week in route beer is already on I know. Board with you. okay um never mind that hagen and bill haven't shown up for a show in two years i'll, I'll remind them <laughs> yeah but, you, uh, please, please if you see them in the hallway uh we have another production meeting next week okay if they would like to show up that'd be really nice i will pass it along thank you but you love uh, but yeah, memes. We, I mean, we love a, we love a good meme here at Dovetail. Um, but yeah, but I think, yeah, I think if you would immediately 
something wouldn't it you wouldn't pass your sniff test you're like what the heck what the heck is dovetail up to um because it always has been just a you know it everything is done with intention uh for sure the way we communicate is done very intentionally but it is very genuine as well what do you see as the evolution of social media and beer like it seems like it's sort of like all over the place these days but is there have people gotten better at it have people gotten worse at it is it is it just social media is sort of a terrible place um and we should all just burn our computers or yeah like it, it, um, it, are, are there are there meaningful things that 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 can or are happening that you see i don't know well i can a, a, i can talk to, i can talk yeah. to this in a couple of ways i can talk to it i'll talk from, from a brewery point of view and from a personal point of view okay um for a personal point of view yes it's totally a hellhole out there in social media but for me um specifically through twitter i've been able to connect with people that you know that i would not have probably had an opportunity to connect with uh before and that's relevant to my my interests like uh you know like evan rail and and the way that he communicates about chuck beer culture um and uh, uh lars and his his research into um, norwegian farmhouse traditions like just just being able to um benefit um from that sort of sort of knowledge um that is a little bit more maybe uh user friendly on twitter and that brings me to the brewery's point of view and i think like each social media space has its own personality and like there are breweries that are amazing at instagram right um they really know how to tell stories visually we're okay at that at dovetail we're okay with that but i think we're like we're better at twitter <laughs> i think it's something that um again is more genuine and natural for us like just the way that we we communicate um facebook i don't know i don't know about facebook man um you know we're on there <laughs> um and hopefully we're like communicating the important things um but for for me um i feel like I feel like we're a twitter brewery um so and i think it's just a matter of finding what platform works best for the message that you want to get out and how you want to connect to the people that drink your beer. Um, you know, there's some breweries that are finding success on TikTok. I absolutely will not be touching TikTok. Um, I, Cause I don't even know I, where I would start. And I don't know what the dovetail story would look like on TikTok. I, yeah, I, I'm like completely illiterate when it comes to that particular site. Um, Enjoy it. <laughs> I've been asking folks on the show for the last couple of weeks, a couple of months now, I guess at this point, uh, there's the television show, The Good Place. And uh, in the final season, there's this whole concept of being able to walk through a green door. And that green door will bring you any time, any place uh, with anybody that you want to be with. So if such a thing existed on this plane of existence and we could finish this conversation and you could walk through a green door and be in any pub or any brewery uh, at any time with anybody that you wanted, where would that green door take you? Uh, that green door would take me to uh, locale in Prague and I would be with my dad. What would be in your glass? Uh, well, it would either have to be Pilsner or Cow or right. Kozel. <laughs> uh, but it would be. Do you have a uh, preference? Uh, well, I mean, Kozel is the one that kind of inspired me to come back and write the Czech Dark Lager recipe that we brew here at Dovetail, um, and it was just the experience of 
of being able to watch, you know, check beer service for the first time. I, I remember going there and asking the bartender if I could just stand at the bar and, wa- <laughs> and he gave me this, he's like, you're crazy. But I, you know, I just watched him pour beer for like a half hour. It was just completely mesmerizing. Um, it was something that I had not seen uh, before. Uh, but also I would love just to be with my dad and just, talk about yeah. you know talk about life and stuff <laughs> um that you know stuff that i hope uh you know people come to our tap room and have a similar experience well everybody get to chicago everybody get to dovetail <laughs> everybody go drink delicious lagers and rauk beer and what's what's the beer that's coming up not gonna get it out of me <laughs> <laughs> Can't blame me for trying. Jenny, thanks for thanks for being on the show this week. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. What beers did your parents and grandparents drink? What are they drinking now? Let me know. You can email me. It's John Hall, J O H N H O L L at beeredge.com, or you can reach out on social media. I'm on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Beer Edge is also on all of the social medias at the Beer Edge. A reminder to join the Smoked Beer Conversation with other enthusiasts on the This Week in Rauk Beer Facebook page or on Twitter and Instagram at TW Rauk Beer. And if you're a brewery or a company that wants to support the show and bring original content to the airwaves, you can help us out through advertising by reaching out to Liz Melby. She's at Liz at BeerEdge.com. And speaking of that, thanks to the companies who help keep us on the air. This dry January, party on all month long with Athletic Brewing Company's great tasting non-alcoholic craft beer. Their full lineup of craft styles lets you drink up and stay dry while keeping things fresh. And with brews starting at only 50 calories, you can stick to your resolutions all while saying cheers. Join the party at athleticbrewing.com and get free shipping on two six packs or more. Plus, new customers can get 10% off with code BEEREDGE10. We're also brought to you by NZ Hops, a cooperative of master growers whose legend and cultivars have been crafted for over 150 years with creativity and passion to produce some of the world's finest hops. With a dedicated hop breeding program and farming knowledge handed down through the generations, the current day master growers proudly provide 18 unique New Zealand hop varieties to the world. Visit nzhops.co.nz or find them on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at nzhopsltd to learn more. Final reminder, check out the Beer Edge podcast with Andy Crouch. New episodes come out weekly. Steal This Beer has new episodes every Monday, and the BYO Nano podcast drops on the 15th of every month. Back here, Nate Schweber performs our theme music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'm going to be back again to drink beer and to think beer.